All right, so welcome everybody uh, to our discussion about the California Social Housing Act. Um, this is a bill that's bringing back potentially uh, social housing and, and really sort of taking time to sort of say what is a good model that California could adopt of public and social housing. And we're having a really interesting discussion about what does it mean to have publicly owned housing? How do we get more different kinds of housing? Um, and it's a real opportunity to talk about how governments build housing all over the world and what kind of options we could bring here to California. Um, so I'll drop a link in for the website of the California Social Housing Act. I'm hoping that all of you guys are excited already to be supporters of this important bill. Um, what's been really fun on the politics end of the spectrum is that this bill has attracted support from institutional sort of stodgy people as well as the social housing radicals. We're seeing uh, support being brought in from the Labor Council and the trades and organizations that uh, we wouldn't necessarily have expected to see this kind of normalization of this idea that we need need uh, different kinds of housing options in California. It's been really exciting. Um, so I'm Laura Foote, I'm the Executive Director of EMB Action. We are one of the sponsors of this bill. I'm very excited to be hosting this panel today. Um, Paul Williams, if you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and, and why are you excited to talk about social housing today? Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Williams. I'm a uh fellow at the Jane Family Institute, which is a research economic policy research organization in, in New York. Uh, and I'm uh, currently um, in the process of founding a, a new organization called the Center for Public Enterprise, which is gonna be focused a lot on, on helping to establish these public sector developers of, of housing, but also of other kind of public institutions um like public banks and public utilities public energy generation and, and things like that um i worked for a number of years for the chicago department of housing um doing um affordable housing development and policy and, and things like that so i'm pretty intimately familiar with how the status quo uh set of tools works and doesn't work um and i'm uh excited about uh, this build which is pretty boldly proposing uh, a new model with a big role for the public sector. Awesome. And next up, Daryl Owens, uh, longtime housing advocate. Um, Daryl, if you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about why you're so passionate. Yeah, um, I'm pretty passionate about this project because it's pretty clear to me looking at the data on the history of housing permitting um, that it is just not efficient at this point and moment in time. Uh, to rely solely on like private investors to finance housing that we need. Um, it's pretty clear that if we're going to reach the production levels needed to keep pace with population growth, we're going to need a lot more public intervention. Um, I've had a lot of evolution about this. Uh, I started off in housing, working in the nonprofit industry, um, mostly building subsidized housing, um, sorry, exclusively subsidized housing uh, under the tax credit model, which is the current foundation of our low income subsidized housing. Um, I got kind of woke by the terribleness of land use. And so that's when I made the jump into Yimbyism. Um, and now I got kind of woke by the terribleness of financing uh, and public intervention. Uh, and so that's why we're making the jump to public housing. And so I'm very excited to be here today. And uh, to talk. Awesome. And I'm going to hand the mic over to our MC and question asker, Derek Sagehorn with East Bay for Everyone. Derek, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, so yeah. You know, Derek Sachorn, uh, he, him, live in Oakland, member of East Bay for Everyone. Um, I was a co-author on our white paper, uh, California Housing Corporation, the case for a public housing developer that came out in 2021. And so we're really excited to work with Assemblymember Alex Lee on AB 2053 and be a, a sponsor along with the action. Um, so I just kind of want to just kind of curate this conversation with Paul and Daryl, just kind of in terms of as, as, you know, as researchers and advocates, what are the important things of a social housing bill for them? Um, so my first question is for Daryl is like, you know, it's very clear that we have a housing crisis, but like, could you describe that need in terms of like the different segments of the of the population? Like, what do we need? Who are we? 
who do we need to plan for in terms of a, a California housing authority, like AB 2053? Like, what are the populations? Where does this housing need to go? Um, what are those kind of considerations we have? We should have in mind. Um, everybody, everybody needs housing. Um, you know, I, 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 we always love to do this. Like, who's more deserving? I actually got asked a very similar question at the panel um, today on social housing. Someone asked me um, a very genuine question of like, well, challenging the mixed income model. Why don't we just prioritize the people who are the poorest of the poor first? And I'm like, well, the issue here is that we need to create sort of a collective class interest. And um, picking and choosing which people are more deserving of housing is not a smart way to go. We need to build housing for everybody because everybody needs it. Um, I don't want to live in a city. I, I, like the thing about the Bay Area is like, Bay Area is a really nice place to live, but it's kind of really sucky to live here because there's only two types of people here. It's rich people and it's like poor people who live in subsidized housing and there's very little in between anymore. Um, it's actually really cool to go out to the country in places that are not the Bay Area because you remember that like, like lower middle income people exist. Um, it, this is kind of a problem that I've been seeing in my own city where it's just an erasure of that. And so it's important to build housing for everybody because everybody has a collective stake in housing. And I don't wanna pick and choose which groups are more important, similar to how we approach things like healthcare. Um, the, the pitch for single payer healthcare is that everyone needs healthcare. Um, we don't just need like Medicaid and then everyone else can go off into the private market or Obamacare. It has to be a collective interest. And so the, the answer is everybody. Population growth has been uh, pretty strong and we need to be sure that we accommodate that which we haven't done since the recession has curbed a lot of our housing production. Great, thank you. Um, so, like Paul, like you know, we are just spoke about the need to, to address housing needs, you know, not only for low income people but for moderate income people as well. I understand that, like on the moderate income side, that's that's an issue with the low income housing tax credit, which is the backbone of our existing subsidized system. Could you kind of describe our existing kind of affordable housing finance system and how that might prevent us from doing a more kind of a mixed income model? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I think this this gets to a, a number of important points about, you know, how housing is financed and how the programs that we have today are designed uh, and, and what it is exactly that they intend to do. So I think a, a kind of starting point is is to ask ourselves, what does it mean? What are we doing with the financials when we say we're subsidizing housing? When we say we're subsidizing housing, we're saying that we want to lower the rents below whatever the market rate or the at cost level would be, right? We want the rents to be lower because they want, we want the rents to be affordable to someone who's at a certain income level. The constraint is obviously whatever our costs are. And of course, you know, a, a small piece of that is, you know, you have your operations costs, you have your staff who are doing cleaning, you have your maintenance fund, you have these things, but the big piece is your debt service cost. And the total, you know, you take out when you, anytime you build a house anywhere in the world, every social housing model, every private model, you take out a loan when you want to build uh, a big uh, housing project and you have to pay that loan back and you have a monthly payment amount. Our very, all of our various low-income housing tax credits, uh, grants, TIF funds, um, other subsidies from the state, all of these things, essentially what they're doing is they're going into that affordable housing deal as an investment and lowering the total amount of debt that you have to pay back at the end of the day, right? So that your monthly debt payment can then be lower, which means that your rents can be lower. Um, and so that's that's like a really big picture thing that I like that I like to start off with because I think it's really important to to um, conceive of everything that we're doing as as kind of attacking that same issue, right? Um, we need to lower that number so that we can lower the rents. And so the low income housing tax credit um, it does that it pumps money into affordable housing deals, but it comes with a whole slew of rules. Um, and constraints that make it really hard to work with, except for doing um, one very specific thing, um, which often doesn't serve the needs of, um, it doesn't necessarily serve the needs of the, of the broader population. So there's an interesting story um, kind of on this point about the school district in LA uh, wanted to build affordable housing for its teachers um, and for students. And they wanted to use the only money that's available to build you know, affordable housing, which is low-income housing tax credit. Uh, and they couldn't do it because their teachers 
made too much to qualify for any low-income housing tax credit building, but they're also but their teachers also made too little to be able to afford um, a lot of housing elsewhere in LA, right? So they're stuck in this kind of like in between uh, no man's land where where they they just just over qualify for this low-income housing tax credit because of the strict rules, and they don't make enough. Um, to not be cost burdened on on you know the housing the rest of this housing situation, uh, housing on the market in LA, and so that's that's just the fundamental problem with these programs, right? Is that they are not flexible at all. They're very strict, um, and they serve a very small specific need, and they're underfunded. Um, and you know that's the really nice thing about this bill is that it's creating a new institution at the state level that has the ability to leverage public financing. Um, to serve a much broader swath of the people of California. Yeah, that's really interesting, you know, what you mentioned about like the, the teachers, you know, the, it's a quintessential kind of like middle-class occupation you would think of, and that we would do, do this whole endeavor to build housing for their benefit, but none of the existing subsidy sources work for that, those income levels. I mean, th that reminds me of, you know, Daryl, um, you know, spoken, uh, at the prior panel at EV Town earlier today, but you know, at, at other like, you know, we had conversations about how, um, you know, the original conception of public works uh, era uh, public housing in America was a broader base, right, of moderate income. So, Daryl, could you just talk about like that, the necessity of having those like kind of like middle income public sector workers, civil servants. Um, you know, your, your more moderate income uh, wage scale groups uh, uh, be able to access this, why that's important? Yeah, I mean, as I've spoken on earlier, there's just a huge cultural difference. If you live in the Bay Area, you're kind of a, at the core of the Bay Area, you really are, and especially places like San Francisco, and I think increasingly places like New York City, um, it's just this weird, like, polarization of incomes where you, you have like people who can live in subsidized housing um, or vouchers, and then you have the ultra rich, um, and then you don't have anybody else. Uh, and that's like, a, that's, not a, that's not a city, right? You, have, you, you basically have like a servant's quarters and then like mm -hmm. the wealthy who you know, run the city. Um, and this is, it's, just like a, it's just a bizarre way to live. And that's what happens in our current subsidized system. Um, we tend to talk about middle income households and people kind of start rolling their eyes because they think, oh, these are like what upper mid level management people. Two teachers making 60K are bringing in 100K a year. Like it's not like, like the, the math there is not as crazy as it sounds. Um, a lot of people who sound like they're wealthy when we talk about these AMI bans are really just average working class people. One of the more frustrating things about the whole housing conversation in general is the sort of assumption that most people of color are like poor. Um, they're not. Most people of color are like decently like middle class working class. And so again, the point is, is that we need to create a sort of collective class interest in housing. Um, this is sort of what I don't even know if you could really argue this was the original intent of New Deal era public housing. Um, but the point was, is that during the Depression, we weren't building a lot of housing, um, that we were going to build housing for everyone because the developers weren't doing it. So we're going to do it, the state. Um, but of course, you know, Jim Crow, Dixie people um, tried to regulate that to race. And then the real estate industry came in. So, of course, a lot of the initial public housing was white only. And then the real estate industry came in and uh, actively uh, lobby to make sure that public housing would increasingly only apply to the poor, while simultaneously there was the expansion of the FHA, which was subsidizing people into the private market. So in the United States, almost all of our subsidies seem to go towards private interests, something Paul alluded to, including the low-income tax credit. The 501c3s are not um, public sector. And so this leads to a really inefficient use of funds. You constantly have money changing hands and going through different stakeholders in the private sector um, to leverage them, which makes it very ineffective to build housing at the scale that we need. And I say that as somebody who used to work in 501c3 low-income housing finance, um, a lot of projects just couldn't pencil because you got two, three people acting as turnkey developers, landholders, so on and so forth. And there's just very poor state management. So it's really important that the state has the capacity to build affordable housing here um, for all income groups. Right. Yeah. And I want to just keep like key off of like, you know, there are our existing model of like disinvested mid-century American public housing, like that's not the only path. I think it's clear to, you know, people who have engaged in the literature there, like there's so much else out there. And, you know, as much as, you know, when we talk about policy here, um, 
if you talk to an elected official, they'll be like, don't talk to me about Singapore. Don't talk to me about Tokyo. Like they don't want to learn anything from other countries. But like Paul, like, you know, as as people who are interested in the, the details here, like what can we, what are like the, the, the systems of, what are the, what's different in like countries that have strong social housing provision? Like what do they do that, that you know, we would be looking to do in, in something similar in California or elsewhere? Yeah, um, you know, the, so I'll, I'll take one example to start with. Um, I'll talk about uh, Helsinki, Finland, which has, uh, uh, it has three different municipal housing companies. So these are just social housing companies that are owned by the city of Helsinki, uh, and they all serve slightly different purposes. Um, and the, the, I'll get into them, but the, you know, the city of Helsinki created these social housing companies, you know, 40 years ago. Um, and now they've gotten up to this point where they have, they are, you know, a significant part of, of the um, housing market in Finland, right? I mean, uh, something like 20% of all rental housing in Finland is owned by one of these, um, you know, Helsinki Min municipal housing companies, HECA, which is the, you know, largest one. But, you know, they, they've, they created these institutions and they took the time and made the investments to scale them up and gave them the authorities that they need uh, and, and the uh, you know investments that they need in order to to scale up. So I'll just you know I'll go over those real quickly. One the one the main one is HECA, which is the really broad based just social housing. Um, you know something like seventy five percent of all people in Finland qualify to live in in HECA housing. Right, it's like very wide eligibility, um, not purely universal. Um, and then they have one social housing company that is. You know, specifically a housing first uh, approach for people who are, you know, uh, formerly homeless people and people dealing with uh, substance abuse. And so that's like, you know, that's, you know, similar to what we would think of as like the zero to 15% AMI band here, right? They have a separate company that's specifically dealing with uh, housing for people who, you know, need those specific social services. Um, and then they have a social housing company that's specifically for employees of the municipality. Um, and so they've, you know, they've just created this network of, of public agencies that are helping them, um, you know, help, helping them build uh, enough housing and, and, you know, and do it with public ownership. And one other thing they have that, that I think is really important is there's a public bank uh, called Munifin, which is owned by the municipality and all of the surrounding suburbs. So they all kind of co- operatively own this public bank that does all of the lending for any housing that any of them, any social housing that any of them build, hospitals, schools, transit, all of these different things are, are financed by a cooperative public bank. Um, and so they're able to do all of these projects like social housing at 0% interest, right? Because they get a, a subsidy on the interest rate. Um, and so they've just they've built up this network of institutions that are able to facilitate all of the kind of public investments that they want to see, and I think that's I think that's really the a core piece of, of what um, the move toward establishing public developers of social housing in the United States is about. Is we need to establish these institutions and and drive them for a while and figure out you know I mean learn from from what they're capable of and and figure out where we want to take them. Yeah, I definitely think like the the sense that that you get when you look at like HECA is that like they've they spent like 80, 90 years working through this where they've created like the good internal structures. And now say like if we created a California housing authority, a corporation, or whatever, overnight that they would be there, but you gotta start somewhere, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean it's you know, you know, they didn't I mean, it took them decades, right, to, to um, do that. I mean, obviously, you know, there's there's one very cool example uh, from Sweden in, in uh, the mid 60s through the mid 70s, where the, the national government em embarked on what they dubbed the Million Homes Program, where they literally built a million homes over a span of 10 years, uh, mostly with these municipal companies, but all, all public investment. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's also feasible to do um, you know, really big scale um, if you really want to, you know, put everything into it. Right. And so, Daryl, I just want to turn to you, like, 
could you kind of just um you know, for the audience like describe you know AB 2053 what, what it's looking to do in terms of social housing right so we're running into a problem here we're basically producing about 85,000 units or homes um a year in the uh, state of California and uh, we need to double that uh, according to the LEO, uh, just to keep pace with the population. Um, and, and this has been a huge problem that seems almost impossible. And so this is why we worked with the East Bay for Everyone on developing a social um, that would create an agency uh, to build this. Am I breaking up? You're getting a little choppy there. Yeah, I get a little choppy. Yeah, uh, hotel. Right here. Hotel. Take, 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 take a moment. Take a minute. Oh yeah, try try video off. Let's see if that helps. Okay, give us a. You, you were talking about uh, working. With Everyone always says that I never see it does anything, but it's slightly better. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So basically, the the point is. Okay. All right. Uh, the point is, is that um, with East Bay for Everyone, we worked on the white paper uh, to build a public housing agency, and then we wanted to launch it at the state level. Um, so this will help fill that gap of doubling our housing production um, annually, which LAO agrees is needed just to keep pace with existing population growth. And so um, Assembly Member Alex Lee, youngest Assembly Member in the Legislature, uh, Democratic Socialist, has worked with us almost since the beginning on making this happen. Um, and it's been going great so far. Uh, we have a long way ahead, though. We've only been through like one committee, so you know, a long way ahead. But uh, we've been doing good so far. Just to clarify, the committee is uh, on April twentieth, four twenty, uh, in Assembly Housing. Um, but uh, that's coming up. So, Paul, like in terms of what um, you know, how something like AB twenty fifty three would work, like. Well, how would the financing work? For that? That's a that's a critical question that people that keep keep asking, and I think we're so used yeah, to the yeah. long income housing tax credit, um, where it kind of you know you just park that in, and you have to go through another round and ask for more state local subsidies. Um, they're not used to the idea of just like putting in a bond and then building something. So if you could just kind of describe that process for people. Yeah, and I I actually I have just a couple of slides that I will share just to help walk through, just to help visualize a couple of the, the kind of basics here. Um, so there's, there's kind of two, um, there's kind of two subsidies that are baked into to the kind of mixed income cross subsidized social housing model. Um, this right here is just a market rent model, right? You have uh, a cost level that is, you know, this is your debt service payments and your operations costs and your and your maintenance fund. Um, and if market rents are above that, then everything above that is is profits. That's margin for you, the developer. Um, oops. The cross subsidy model is you have a set of people who are paying somewhere above that cost level for you. And you have some people who are paying below that cost level. And as, I mean, all that matters to you at the end of the day is that, you, is that you know, all that matters to us at the end of the day as the California um, Housing Authority is that we're able to pay back our bonds, right? And so we just have to meet that cost and we can meet it however we want. I mean, no matter what we're doing, whether we're, whether we're, you know, um, whether you want to do grant funding and just pump money into the buildings, you're still going to, you still have to make those payments. That's not something that goes away. This is a way that allows us to um, essentially get, uh, be able to offer much lower rents to a whole bunch of people who are living in the building uh, without pumping in a bunch of extra money um, at the front end. Right. So I think the way to think about this is that, um, you know, you start off with this model with the cross subsidy, um, and then every dollar that you do pump in later on, every voucher that uh, every housing choice voucher that you're able to attach to the building, um, every other state subsidy that you plug in is going to 
go further than it would without this approach. Um, so in terms of the actual bond financing and the structure of the deals, this is, uh, this is a slide here from the Montgomery County, Maryland uh, Housing Opportunity Commission, which is their public housing authority, which kind of describes the process for their uh, housing production fund, which is the way that they've uh, devised that allows them to, you know, essentially just use municipal bonds with a small, with a very small seed fund that they got from their county government um, to make these investments in um, in these mixed income cross subsidized publicly owned deals that they're building. So the way it works for them is they get a very small appropriation from the county government every year, um, you know, a few million dollars. They issue a bond on that appropriation, you know, because they're getting it every year for 20 years, they issue a bond to get it all up front. And then they take that money that they got from issuing the bond and they use it to invest in a couple of different projects all at once. Um, and so, you know, these projects they invest in, they're putting, you know, maybe 20, 30% of the total project cost in from the bond um, that they issued. And the rest, they're just, you know, getting a normal construction loan. Um, but then when they get the building all leased up uh, and all the rents start getting collected, then they go out and they get permanent financing, meaning, you know, essentially meaning that they refinance the whole package they buy that bond out that they, that they put in in the beginning and they put it back into the fund. And then the next day that money can go back out the door, right? So they, they, got this, they got this fund at the beginning, it goes out into projects, the projects get built, leased up, the money goes back into the fund and then it can go out into another deal. Um, so you essentially get this kind of revolving fund and this, and this is the way that private um, development companies work, right? They build projects, they take out loans, they continue to own the projects, they refinance, they get equity, and then they go reinvest and build another project. Um, and that's, you know, that's essentially how the social housing company in Singapore works. That's how the social housing companies in Finland work, right? They're just, they're just kind of copying uh, the way that private developers work, but instead of taking profits, they're reinvesting everything in lowering the rents and building more projects. Um, and I think I, I think that's you know a, a really simple way to kind of to think about it, right? Is private developer builds, they make profits. If you have a public owner, just take all of that out, lower the rents, and reinvest everything in your next project. Um, I have a few more slides. I I can maybe come back to those if uh, folks. Have yeah, yeah, we can we can come back to that. But I just wanted to like key on like the the thing you said about like the housing choice vouchers is um. You know, at the time yeah. of a project, like you can imagine your local housing authority has 50 housing choice vouchers that they haven't been able to, like people haven't been able to find a landlord, right? They want to live in this community, right? but as we know, private landlords can be, you know, particularly discriminatory, especially against voucher holders of as a proxy totally. for all types of things. And so I, I, I think that's like an underappreciated aspect of this is if we can build these types of projects in affluent suburbs, for example, um, or places where landlords, there's not a lot of rental housing or, or uh, people have uh, engaged in patterns of Section 8 voucher discrimination, suddenly we can plug those vouchers in and we have, you know, those can help support the project. And so it's just totally. about like that flexibility because it's like, I think that's a, right. that's a thing that people get lost is like with public ownership, we can kind of like, we can be like we set all the rules right we can if we get if maybe we start at certain levels of affordability and we get more more affordability to fall into our lap we just plug it into where it already exists versus having to go like let's go door to door to all these private landlords so can you just talk about that flexibility and why it's so important yeah totally I, you know i i think this gets into a little bit too about some of the, the planning aspects and, and you know how housing is going to get built in you know different places in California um, when this bill passes. Um, but yeah, I think I I think that that flexibility is really important because in different places across the state, you're going to have all kinds of different local conditions where you may have um, you know like I know in San Francisco there's a ballot measure where uh, there's a proposition to increase the real estate transfer tax, which raised a bunch of funds for social housing. 
a lot of that money can go essentially into buying down the rents in in public developments, for example, that that um, the CHA would be building. LA, I know, is trying to establish a public um, bank, and that's something that can help facilitate uh, lower interest uh, mortgage loans, which is going to allow you. Know, it, when you have this public agency, it's it's going to be able to interact with all of these other public entities that have different types of subsidy that they can plug in um, to the CHA's public housing. And I think yeah. that's that's um, I mean, there's just so much you can do there, right? And 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 that's you know that's essentially what happened in a lot of these other countries is they they had these various public institutions that started interacting more and more with each other, and then it you know established these kind of institutional relationships that were like. Right, we found the right way to do this. Right, and th there's one thing I wanted to key on there is, uh, you know, clearly like San Francisco is has their um, their their local social housing efforts, and I understand LA is interested, and Berkeley is interested, and so like, how would like um, AB twenty fifty three California Housing Authority, how could it interact and help those efforts at the local level besides just giving totally. us money? But like if they like if they have a project, what, yeah, yeah, what yeah. could CHA do to help their projects? Totally. I think I think there's a number of things. And I, I think this is a kind of exciting part about it is is uh, I mean, you know, it's a very nerdy kind of exciting thing about it. But you know, thinking about um, San Francisco ballot initiative uh, that passed, right? A lot gave gave San Francisco the authority under Constitutional amendment is in your Article Thirty Four. Article Thirty Four. Right? Yeah. Article yeah. You had to you had to authorize ten thousand units. Um, gave them that, and it gave them some funds. What what San Francisco does not have um, right now, unfortunately, is an institution with the kind of administrative capacity to put together a publicly owned social housing deal. That is something that the AB twenty fifty three would create at the state level, right? And so you have this natural thing where San Francisco is like. I have legal authority to build 10,000 units and I have some money. CHA is like, I have a new agency or a division of, of whatever that, that has administrative capacity and people who wanna put deals together, let's link and build, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have all of these different kinds of relationships that, that could work out. And then you also have, um, um, what do you guys call it in California, the joint power? Oh, uh, joint powers agencies, yeah, yeah. Joint powers agencies, right? In, in, you know, it, it, that may be something in, in some of your, um, you know, slightly more uh, suburban or sprawly areas where uh, the municipal governments like absolutely do not have the administrative capacity to do any of this stuff, but they may have uh, a JPA or, or some kind of county agency um, that has land, right? Or you may have a transit agency that has land and it's like, oh, hey, I wanna participate in, in one of these social housing deals. I'll give you the land and and uh, you know we'll make the deal work. There's just right. all kinds of different ways that that um, you know an agency can you know state agency can interact. And uh, and I, I think that things. partnership is, is is so key because it's like right now um, community land trusts are like this great tool that we have to put land into kind of public or collective stewardship, but unfortunately, like so many of the, these CLTs are. They're understaffed. They're under resourced. They don't have access to the level of subsidies that the light tech, for profit or nonprofit developers have, and so they're basically in a like a holding action. It's like let's require as much housing that we can preserve long term afford affordable, but they're not actually in the production mode. And I wouldn't expect them to. Like you wouldn't expect uh, one co op to like become a developer, right? And so I think maybe the move is is like community land trust, you have access to parcels. Maybe you have a underbuilt, some some underbuilt parcels or commercial parcels that we can build on. Let's, our underwriters, our project managers, our contract administrators, there's so much that goes into it that you can't expect one CLT in one particular city or neighborhood to do. So I think that's a part, part of the partnerships. For Daryl, I, I wanted to come back to this like question of like suburban, like in kind of like the, but the bigger like statewide focus, like, we need homes, not just in the coastal markets, but also in the Central Valley, in these suburbs. And we need, you know, home ownership, like a, a limited equity home ownership and also rental. So could you kind of talk about like why it's important to have that state lens, you know, as well as like working with the locals in like cities that are more, you know, more left wing, more supportive of these ideas, why we need that like statewide approach 
for other parts of the region and, and the state? Right. Um, a lot of the of housing finance in the private sector is pretty heavily focused on the coast um, or metro areas close to the coast. Um, so what this leads to is these huge levels of underinvestment in high demand areas. You have places like Fresno, uh, for example, which is seeing like the third highest population growth in the state. And there's basically no private developers building there despite favorable zoning conditions um, because rents aren't high enough to secure financing from private lenders, right? So you have to wait until rents get very high. You know, the reality is, is that developers actually go where rents are the highest because that's the highest level of revenue they can generate. And so this is a problem. We see what we deal with this in Oakland, right? Like in Oakland, developers don't go east of the lake. Um, rents are skyrocketing in some neighborhoods. You have almost a million dollar homes now. Um, all the zoning in East Oakland is completely favorable for high density development, and there's no private developers there, um, barely a thimble full, most of them oriented around the BART station, because to them, the rents are still too low in the median area, and the, that lenders just won't secure it. So we're stuck with this big problem where you have a lot of communities suffering from like overcrowded conditions, um, especially in rural areas um, or semi-rural or, or, or valley agricultural oriented cities um, suffering from overcrowding, uh, dilapidated housing, and there's no private developer interest whatsoever to build housing until the rents become too high to the point where it doesn't really matter. Um, and that's where the public agency would step in and actually you know, provide that housing that's needed. Um, that's why it's so important that this has to be a state operation and not just like a local one. Um, there's been a lot of debate about whether it should be local or state or regional, and the truth is, is that it should clearly be state because so much of our housing needs, especially in these wildfire areas, um, are not being fulfilled by the private market. And so, I mean, that is that is some of the regional appeal here. Yeah, and you know, I, I like how you're talking about it. it's like, you know, you, it might not seem like it, but there's overcrowding in these rural places, right? Like it's it's you see if you actually look the California uh, Department of Housing and Community Development just came out with a state housing plan. And one of the striking things was like Stanislaus, uh, Fresno County, Tulare County had some of the highest levels of overcrowding and rent burdens, like even more than the Bay Area. And so I think that's an important kind of lens for this. Um, so like, you know, we, clearly we've got some, um, some momentum at least for social housing in California. I, I saw on the chat that Senator Stanley Chang of Hawaii is, is joining us, um, but maybe, um, Paul, could you just kind of describe some of the correlate efforts that are going around um, in other parts of the U.S. that are kind of mirroring or at least um, corresponding to sure. these efforts? Yeah, um, there are quite a few cropping up over the past six to 12 months, and it's it's pretty exciting. Um, Senator Stanley Chang in Hawaii was a, 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 an early adopter of the model and has been um, pushing for a... Um, uh, public developer to do a, a kind of uh, home ownership program uh, modeled a lot like Singapore's uh, public housing. Um, and that bill is in the Hawaii legislature. Uh, obviously, there's AB 2053 in California. Um, there's a public ballot initiative that just got filed in Seattle, Washington. Um, they're going to be collecting signatures for that over the next couple of months, and hopefully it'll be on the November ballot. But that initiative would establish a what's called a, a public development authority, which is you know part of the Washington state law um, in Seattle that would be authorized to you know essentially be a, a public developer of, of mixed income housing. Um, there is obviously Montgomery County, Maryland, where the local housing authority has kind of uh, created this model on its own, where they're uh, you know they they found a way to do public ownership. Uh, and cross subsidy um, uh, and make it work. And, you know, I mean, that they, it's a pretty interesting. They did, there was not a, a kind of political campaign to make that happen. It was, uh, you know, uh, somebody who worked for the uh, department who's a, you know, interesting person um, came up with this model and said, oh, what if we just, you know, did public ownership and we just did this cross subsidy? We could essentially just like build forever, right? Like we have this revolving fund and we could just keep going and going. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, there's a number of other places that are hoping to introduce, um, some legislation over the next couple of weeks and months. Um, I know there's people, uh, hoping to put together some legislation in Rhode Island, um, to try and make use of some of the ARPA dollars, uh, to establish a kind of pilot, um, to do this 
to do uh, a public developer. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. I know there's a couple more. I mean, there's other folks I've talked to who are interested, but I, I think that's everything as far as legislation that is either introduced or kind of um, yeah. on the way. Right. And obviously, you know, New York, um, where I am, um, you know, working on it, we'll get there someday. Right. Um, I mean, but, you know, from three or four years ago, what right. may have just been a meme online to actually introducing legislation and moving on it, it's pretty exciting. Um, so I just want to do, I did want to key in on something is um, the, the aspect of um, limited equity home ownership in, in one form or another is part of this bill. Daryl, could you kind of just talk about why having that, like, that home ownership aspect of it is an important part of the puzzle? Yeah, I think that for a lot of people, I mean, it it, it is sort of a, a pseudo form of home ownership. It's not literal land ownership. Um, but the idea that you would be able to build equity off of your public housing homes, I think is actually a really restorative process for an entire generation of communities and racial groups, particularly black and historically redlined peoples um, who have basically been left out of the wealth building um, home ownership cycle. And then when they were given a slight slice of it in the 90s and the 2000s with these subprime mortgages, um, it completely blew up in our face and, and collapsed. So it's going to require some level of like public investment in the wealth building of um, history. Marginalized people and, and people getting affordable home ownership opportunities, and uh, this is somewhat more controversial because number one, this is not like any kind of public housing that's even that common outside of the United States. I mean, this is very much a Singaporean model. Um, I think Europe generally operates on cooperatives, um, but but I think that it's actually really good insofar as that you can really solve that home ownership opportunity. You know, rental housing is good, um, but like for a lot of people, like rental ideally would just be a short term thing. Um, it's becoming a permanent form of living and housing because generally home ownership is out of reach for most people. And so imagine if you had like 200K home ownership opportunities in like the core of San Francisco. That's a major deal for uh, uh, your average middle class black family. And maybe that would stem the bleeding of uh, people going out to places like Houston and, and the suburbs of Antioch and wherever to buy homes. Because a lot of people, especially when they hit their 30s and 40s, are trying to become homeowners, irrespective of whether you think that's right or not. And uh, they don't want to be left out of the ability to have stable housing and, and the revenue that that brings from this equity. And I think that a permanent rental model is, is exclusively only rental, rental model um, doesn't truly stem the displacement tide. So I think that the home ownership component is really important, but we have to get it right. Yeah, no, I like that. So, but on the rental side, um, you know, I... And we have a history of, you know, there's contentious relationships between local public housing authorities and tenants just about, you know, the disinvestment, the mistreatment of so many of these groups. What in AB 2053, um, and then just generally, what are the important things to think about making sure that for how, like the tenants of California Housing Authority uh, developments, like that, that they have um, power and security going forward what are the I mean, there, there, there's there's been you know the, a lot of tenant groups want a tenant council and so that's on that's in the bill um tenant representation in the government is very important and i think that um yeah, that is an issue historically with public housing and this is one of the reasons why hud died or, or at least hud funded public housing died is that um tenants would basically be ignored for repairs we can all think of the old public housing projects and so it's important to have tenant voices um, on a representative government. And so, I mean, yeah, the, the proposal for California Housing Association or corporation, whatever, whatever we're calling it now, it <laughs> switches every time. Uh, the California public housing developer, um, well, yeah, it needs, of course, tenant representation, similar to like a sort of tenant form of a HOA. Um, and I think that that's a, it's a really good call. Yeah. And, Paul, do you, is there anything that you have in mind? Yeah. And I mean, I think some other things that are, um, uh, you know, when you're, you know, you were, we were talking earlier about like what, flexibility and do you have when you're the public um, and and when you're the public developer you have the ability to guarantee things um, to tenants that no private market actor is going to guarantee I mean you know we can pass laws and we try and we do pass laws to stabilize rents and provide you know good cause and right to renew your lease and and you know measures that are you know just basic tenant stability um, and uh, you know I mean in 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 public housing today like HUD public housing today, all tenants have rent stabilization and and good cause protections, right? They have the right to renew their lease. I mean, obviously there are a lot of very strict rules, but they essentially have, you know, a form of good cause. And when you're a public um, agency, you can guarantee that um, 
to tenants too, um, to just ensure that you have, you know, um, stability. Uh, I mean, you're providing, you know, that's the thing about a public developer of social housing is, um, you know, the, the word social comes from the fact that, the, that it is, you know, in service of a social good, right? This is a, a, a social good that we're trying to provide. Um, and then, you know, another thing I, I think about is um, uh, in relation a little bit to what happened with public housing in the, you know, 60s and 70s and 80s in, in this country, um, where, you know, buildings kind of um, fell apart, uh, very mostly because they were, you know, underfunded. Um, in, in Finland, uh, in HECA, which is like the, you know, large uh, social housing company, Every building has a tenant association with elections, and then every building sends tenant association representatives to the, you know, um, to the city tenant association, and all of those, um, it, and you know, the, the public sector HECA is facilitating um, this relation. I mean, helping to facilitate this relationship, and um, by ensuring that the tenants, you know, kind of have a voice in. Uh, what repairs are wanted, um, you know, what investments would you like to see in the building and things like that. Um, and another example is, I, I uh, heard about this recently, read about this recently in, in Singapore, in the public housing, um, the, uh, in the rental, uh, or not in the rental, um, the uh, residents in the buildings can vote on um, different like food trucks or restaurants um, that come like into the courtyards in between the buildings. And so like, you know, there's, there's all these different food trucks that like move around the city and so residents. Not just being able to paint your walls, but like having how you. Right. I mean, it's like, space. yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like a little bit like more actively like participation in like shaping the environment and community that you're, you're living in. Right. Like, I mean, you're never, we don't have anything like that here where like, I can't like, talk to my neighbors and like vote on like what food truck comes nearby, right? But you have a public yeah. developer who's like facilitating these relationships like uh, within the community. Mm -hmm. And it's like these, you know, social goods that you have a lot more ability to shape outcomes like that. Yeah, and I just wanted to like, one thing I just want to key on is that like, when we talk about rent stabilization for units that would also apply to the higher income units within these developments as well, right? And so, to the extent that you know we where there are ongoing efforts to extend rent control to both new like newer construction and to other parts of the state this can perform of of kind of security of tenure even for higher income people can kind of create politics to support hopefully would support um you know rent control and stabilization in other contexts as well so, so um you know we, we've talked for quite a bit i just wanted to uh before the end of the hour just turn it over to Laura to see if there's any kind of questions from the audience. Yeah, let's do some questions. Raise your hand if you would like to talk. And I I want to put on the spot Stanley Chang, so long as he's here, we might as well. Uh, <laughs> does anyone want to ask him a question? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna allow to talk if he would like to, but also <laughs> so long as we have a star. Stanley Chang is the public housing, social housing guy in Hawaii. As I said, the trifecta on the, <laughs> to the West. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, sorry if my reception is not so good I'm at the mall, but it's a real honor to be here with such hammers, as we say in Hawaii, of social housing. And it's super gratifying to hear that there's so much momentum nationwide now. Um, you know, I just wanted to put in an additional plug for this idea of housing as a public utility public services are for the public and um, you know, public schools, public highways, public parks, none of them have income restrictions um, and everyone needs housing. And so I don't see why housing shouldn't have income restrictions either. So um, I really think that this is a, a fundamental issue. In fact, if the very wealthy were to live side by side in public housing alongside formerly homeless families, wouldn't we celebrate that? You know, that's, that's great. That would be fantastic. Um, just like if, billionaires kids were to go to public school alongside the you know formerly homeless kids or the homeless kids um, and so I really firmly believe that income restrictions are not where we should be I think un income restrictions are un-American and the most successful programs whether it's public parks public um, highways social security medicare are the ones without income restrictions in fact in Washington they used to say um, a program for the poor is a poor program 
So um, I really think we should learn from these failures and we should um, go back to that model of housing for everybody, just like we have school for everybody. Yeah, I will say like, that's one of the things that I really love about in particular um, Japanese UR housing. Uh, it's really incredible how even a foreigner can go to Japan and basically walk into a public housing complex and just get a lease like <laughs> like like it's nothing um, and and like that that level of supply abundance of course it's not mainly through public housing there but especially outside of Tokyo they have such such a surplus of these like public housing homes you can just walk in and get one means testing and wait lists are generally the enemy of any good public program and so that is the ideal, that is my dream world, which is that this program is so successful. Um, if I wanna move somewhere tomorrow, um, there's gonna be a public housing unit I could just walk into. I think that's, that's really the ideal here. If I can add on, I mean, I think the politics of this do become really tricky when we've got such a huge need for the lowest income people, when we're talking about a universal program, I do have a lot of sympathy for people who emotionally are like, if you're building a universal program, that means there's less, you know, we, that scarcity mindset where we have a lot of people who believe that either we're going to be helping one group of people or we're going to be helping another group of people and don't necessarily see the opportunity to be helping everyone at the same time and that that actually makes for a more stable program that has more buy-in. I'm wondering, Stanley, as, as you're trying to normalize this idea, what kind of pushback are you getting from people and, and what do you think we need to be saying about social housing to help normalize this idea for the politics? Yeah, I think people are very locked into these policies of, you know, everything that HUD had ever done, is, you know, income restricted, basically. And so I think people are just used to that. And so when I talk to people, especially who are knowledgeable, what I try to do, and I know this is mansplaining because a lot of people know this history better than I do. But, you know, during the Roosevelt and Truman and Johnson administrations, um, there was this large federal effort to build a lot of housing for everybody, um, although there were income restrictions. Um, what happened was when Republicans took over, like Gerald Ford, they being pro-private sector, then as now, um, Gerald Ford wanted to take, instead of the federal government directly providing housing, he wanted to take that money and give it to private landlords. And that is today the Section 8 program. Um, when Ronald Reagan came in, he came in and he wanted to get the federal government out of the business of building housing and instead give the money to private sector developers. And that's LIHTC today. So these are, these are really Republican policies. And not that Republicans are always wrong, but it's that the, you know, they it's coming from a fundamentally different place, which is a giveaway, frankly, to the private sector, which I don't think any of us, even on the right today, would, would support. It, I'll, I'll add one other piece of history from that that I think is, is particularly important, that the, the public housing program uh, in its original iteration when it was, you know, before the National Housing Act of 1937 that officially established it, when public housing was just a division of the Public Works Administration during the New Deal. Uh, those first two years, everything that was built um, was just moderate cost rents. And of course, a lot of low income people moved into those new um, public housing properties because they were you know, cheaper rents. Uh, and they were nice new modern buildings. Um, there, yeah, and it was race restricted. Um, and was the thing that tipped off the real estate industry and said, oh, wait, this program means trouble for me. Because what they said is, this, this is the public sector that's kind of competing with me, right? The public sector is offering these rents to people and they're lower cost than what I'm providing, right? Because I have my profit margin that I need to, that I want to make. Um, and it was, and it was uh, landlords who went to Congress in 1937 and said, hey, hey, you can do this program, but only if you do it for like, these really low bands of incomes of people that I wasn't gonna build housing for anyway. And I think that's a really um, important uh, piece of history to kind of internalize when we're thinking about, you know, what we want to advocate for. Um, because I actually do think that, it, that it's important that, that we, that, you know, if we wanna to move towards this vision of, you know, providing housing as kind of a, uh, a public good, uh, a public utility as, as Senator Cheng says, um, uh, you know, we are necessarily going to be in competition with other people who are providing that. Um, and I, and I don't think we should shy away from it. 
Awesome. So we've got a question from the audience, Hans Howe, and I'm actually going to flesh it out even more. How can we get more pro-housing advocates to embrace social housing given the politics? And I want to add events like this definitely help uh, where we're talking to a lot of pro-housing advocates. Um, and I also think it's important for us to acknowledge the kind of ideological hodgepodgery that is the pro-housing movement. And while left YIMBY is like, yes, social housing, I get it, I want it. Um, we do have people who are coming at it from more of a private property rights perspective coming in and, and joining in coalition with us on housing advocacy, but are nervous about social housing and public housing. Um, how can we help normalize this idea for people who are pro-housing but are nervous about social housing? And I'll pick on Daryl. Oh, um, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't to, to, to try to appeal to moderate YIMBY or moderate pro-housing people as far as the, I mean, I just make the comparisons to any other kind of like market failure. I know that a lot of people will say, well, we just have to endorse the Tokyo model um, where you just have lots of private housing construction and it'll bring rent down for everybody. But even Tokyo has huge housing wait lists for their public housing. Um, so that's clearly a market failure, even in places with very uh, lax uh, zoning rules. Um, even the question with zoning reform is always like, how low down the income strata can you get um, housing affordable for the market? But it's never going to reach zero um, by definition. So uh, obviously you need public housing investment and there's no place that this hasn't proven to work. Um, ideologically, I just don't know why anybody would oppose it. Uh, it just it's a it's a clearly needed intervention um if you look at the cyclical nature of the market like I, I would say to people who believe that it's just a matter of like regulation reform which is important yes but it, it's only part of the puzzle here um how do you explain the constant dip in housing production in the 2008 recession and then recently in the 2020 uh, uh covid recession uh, we all had a sense that COVID was going to be somewhat temporary, and we all had a sense, um, and I had a sense, we knew that a lot of people were in need of housing. There was these huge bidding wars. So why did permitting go down? Clearly, the lending industry is pretty hawkish. The banking industry is pretty hawkish towards overproducing housing, especially after the foreclosure crisis. And that is an unfortunate failure that has become, you know, financial policy. And there's no way around that besides public intervention. Totally agree on on all that. Yeah, and I, I mean, it brings up another point. I mean, what you said about about you know production you know falling in in two thousand eight. I think this is actually um, you know I mean I, I I think there are a lot of arguments for public developers that that really do come down to like this is actually just a very common sense way to do things um, that I think is you know is palatable to someone who's you know skeptical of of the public sector doing anything. Um, and, you know, like when there is a recession, one of the first indicators that tells us that a recession might be coming is housing starts just plummet, right? And new permits plummet and then construction jobs go with them. And then um, investment goes with that. And, you know, those are the kind of those are building blocks that are a part of almost every recession in US history, right? Housing starts fall, jobs fall, wages fall, everything starts to fall. Um, and you know, one of the big reasons that housing starts um, will plummet is because uh, of loss of investor confidence, right? Like you may have a you may even have a bank ready to do a loan. You have workers who are ready to build housing, you have people who are ready to live in housing but you have investors who are like, eh, it's a little bit risky right now, there might be a recession coming. Um, and it's, you know, this kind of snowballing effect we know where, uh, you know, investor lack of confidence kind of snowballs into um, recessions. So we should have the public sector there essentially to say, well, I don't have to let that happen. I don't have to let um, housing production plummet and all these construction jobs go away and all these wages go down just because these investors decided that right now is a little bit risky. Like I'm the public sector. I don't care if it's a little bit risky. People need housing. And there's kind of an example of this on, on there's actually two interesting examples of this. I'll try and go through quickly. Um, one, there was a, a, a little bit of research done uh, looking at housing prices and housing costs in Austria compared to Ireland um, pre-2008 
that recession and, and post recession. Um, and I don't have the charts on these slides that I that I brought, but you know, the in Ireland where there's very little social housing production, um, you know, before the recession, prices were going way up, and then the recession hit and they went way down and then they swung back up. Whereas in Austria, costs were just relatively flat all the way through um, the recession because the public sector uh, finances and does a lot of the housing production and it just continued doing so, right? It's like- Well, and it have... knows that there will be citizens, you know, the public sector it knows right. that there are gonna be people whether the who economy are... is doing well or poorly. Who right, are exactly, right. It's like, right, it's people don't, people don't need housing less during a recession. If anything, they probably need it more, you know? Um, and another, and another uh, of this that is, uh, you know, a, one very small example, but I think it paints a picture of, of what could happen is one of the projects that Montgomery County is building, um, the P Public Housing Authority of Montgomery County is building right now, started as um, there was a private developer who we had built, you know, several buildings in an area, several apartment buildings in an area. Uh, and this, you know, they wanted to build the last building in this kind of larger project. Um, and they had done all the site planning and architecture and all these things. And the investor um, walked away from the deal and said, actually, I don't want to do this deal anymore. The developer went to Montgomery County and said, you guys are doing this new program. Do you want to do this deal with me? Well, the public housing authority said, yes, but I'm going to become the majority owner. I'm going to make 40% 40 40 of your units affordable at very low income. I'm going to take some ground floor retail for a social service provider. And then I'll build that deal with you. Right. And so the public sector came in and just and stabilized that production that otherwise might have just fallen through the cracks. Right. Yeah, and so money. now instead instead of it, right. And instead of it falling through the cracks, now um, almost half of the units are for very low income households. Right. All right. So let's squeeze in our last question. We're a bit over time, but our audience is still with us. So we'll 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 squeeze in the last question. Um, what do you think is the most strategic way to introduce this kind of idea in jurisdictions that are less ideologically left in California than California? And I actually want to add in, we haven't passed it yet in California. So feel free to give a California-based uh, answer to this as well. What do we need to do in order to pass it in California? Because I think California is less left than necessarily we think it is. I mean, I think there's a definitely a conservative streak in California. Um, who are key stakeholders to engage, key conversations to have, early connections to make? Um, and Stanley, feel free to chime in as well as this applies to you. Um, but I'll, I'll call on uh, Daryl first. Um, it was really key to get labor on board. Um, that's one of the things we worked the hardest on. Nothing's getting through the legislature unless it has labor seal of approval, um, especially if the real estate out lobby decides to go hard on it, right? Um, so, you know, that's number one. Number two is getting all unions on board you can possibly get because unions are very good at mobilizing people and turning out people, especially public sector unions. Um, so I think that getting their support is very key. You know, California, I also think that, you know, not trying to overcomplicate it is pretty important too. Um, I even have some reservations about how we're doing it here. I mean, I, I think that I'm not necessarily convinced that establishing a new agency is as important as like maybe taking an existing one like ACD and just making it like actually into a developer. Um, but like that will be hashed out in the bajillion committees is going to go through. Um, so I'm not worried about that being a problem. Uh, but I would say that, you know, they talked about the uh, proposal in um, uh, what was it? Uh, I, I was just on the panel with her. Uh, but uh, I forgot what city. Seattle. 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 Right. I was going to say Seattle or Portland. Um, Seattle. Yeah. I mean, they're doing it via a citizens' initiative, a uh, signature drive. Um, those always work. So, <laughs> well, those are very good. Um, so, there's a lot of options you have here. But I think that the goal is always like step one, um, identify the agency or mechanism to make it run, and then step two, identify the revenue source, and step three, you know, get the game plan rolling. Right. Stanley or Paul want to add anything to that? Um, you know, I'll, I'll just jump in. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm helping quite a few different uh, organizations and legislators across the country who are trying to put uh, things together in different ways. And, and every state, every city, every person I talk to, every legislator I talk to um, has a different 
kind of institutional landscape, right? They either like, you know, as in what do they have public housing authorities in the area who have some capacity to do some of these things that they could, you know, um, put some of the work on? Um, do they have a state housing finance agency uh, that is, has done some like kind of mixed income projects before that, or has like participated in development or, you know, there's all these different um, factors, you know, in, in the institutional landscape. And there's always, um, uh, you know, your kind of organizing and political landscape um, to, you know, make the noise necessary to, to get uh, a bill through uh, and to create enough pressure for it. And I think that's, um, that can be a little bit uh, tricky thing to, to kind of navigate, right? Um, Seattle, uh, the How's Our Neighbors campaign, which is the ballot initiative that they have to establish this public development authority, they're kind of grappling right now with um, how, you know, if they need 51% of voters to say, yes, I want to do this, um, you know, obviously, you know, I think going around saying this is, uh, this is a new um, public agency that is going to like take over and destroy the real estate market. Like that is not going to get 51% of voters to talk about it uh, and, and say they support it. Right. And they're trying to figure out, um, you know, what is the kind of right way to message something to all of the voters that is both like, Hey, this is a really transformative approach to housing and also something that's really common sense. And, and we should have been doing this all along. Um, and trying to find a way to, to hit that message, I think, is is uh, difficult. But um, you know, that's probably going to make or break whether they're um, successful. I mean, I think they will be. I think they're I think they're finding those messages. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's you know, I I I, I think that is one of the cells of of um, public provisions of goods. You know, like like Medicare for all. Um, a sell of it is like this is just common sense like what if we all just paid into a fund and we all got our insurance together right like what if we just had a, a public developer um who didn't have a profit margin to make and just built a lot of housing um i think that is an important sell of a lot of these kind of transformative models all right so let's end with one call to action for folks in our audience what is something that you hope that they can personally do to help advance this cause um, I'll leave it open. Whoever wants to go first, who has an idea. I mean, I can go first too, which is one is sign up at the California social housing.org website, which I will drop the link in and make sure you're on the mailing list. And if you have ties to an organization, ask them to become a supporter of this bill. Um, this is something that is, is right now we're trying to get people from across the entire state to recognize that this is a common sense, approachable, you know, housing for normies, right? This is something that is totally possible in California. Um, and if they make fun of us for being radical leftists, that's fine too. Um, Daryl, what would you like people to do today? Um, get in touch with your uh, state legislator, uh, assembly, and senate. Uh, I'm working on a data tool that'll actually make that really easy for you. Um, and uh, tell them to support AB 2053. Um, please ask them to not gut it, because <laughs> I'm actually more worried that people are going to try to gut it than they're going to actually make it pass. So um, yeah, please support AB 20, uh, 2053. We have an Action Network link in the chat. Um, that's really the best you can do. Right and if you're in the East Bay, join East Bay for everyone, because um, you're kind of going to be in the uh, the, the kitchen in terms of how this policy is going to go forward. So, yes, definitely shout out to this hearing that we're having on 420. Who doesn't want to come to a hearing on 420? Um, and you can call in and voice your support and RSVP for it here. And if you're on, I think the East Bay for Everyone has the communication tools and NIMBY Action has a Slack. We'll be sending out notifications, um, trying to get people to call in their support. Um, Paul, anything to add? You know, um, talk to people that don't know about AB 2053, about what it would do and why it would be cool to have uh, a public agency that's building housing for everyone. Um, and, you know, honestly, I think, you know, I think that uh, East Bay for Everyone is doing a lot to coordinate um, uh, organizing activity and activism to make this, uh, get this bill over the finish line. And I think that's the place to plug in. 
Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. Have a wonderful evening.